go if I wanted to talk to some young people. <laughs> well, I will say one thing. It turns out they could have come to Power Shift West. <laughs> Second, I wanted to say thanks working on Bold Climate Action. I'll have a little more to say about that in a moment. I know there are people more informed and more deserving than I who have talked about it today. Uh, and third, for helping to build a new movement in our political firmament. That wasn't a joke. Uh, <laughs> there is a fundamental argument going on in at least this country. Certainly beyond that, although exactly where the limits of it, it may, might be a global argument, in some respect it is. And that is, do we have duties to one another, or do we merely have freedoms from one another? Even if our freedoms from one another impact other people's freedoms from me. Are we stronger together than we are apart? Or is it everyone for herself, the devil take the hindmost? There is an underlying philosophical debate. When I was at this university for undergrad, I studied Rousseau, because I was required to do so. <laughs> I hear somebody's like, Rousseau. <laughs> And Rousseau had a critical argument that helped shape the political debate, the philosophical debate in this, in the Western world, for decades. It was the idea of the common good. The idea that if each of us merely pursues our own self-interest, it does not necessarily yield the common interest. And when I go to cast a ballot, I do so not merely to advocate for myself, but to advocate for my best conception of what the good ought be. There is a competing idea. By the way, environment, the environment is probably the best example of that notion. If I drive an SUV, I know that it has almost no impact, or fundamentally, essentially, no impact on the air that I breathe or the water that I drink. But I know that if we all do it, we are all screwed. <laughs> I know that if I can spend a little bit less on environmental protections for my milling or my dumping or my otherwise polluting, I can be richer, at least in the short term. But if we all do that, we're all screwed. There is a competing argument. It is Ayn Rand's big lie of the 20th century. Reward the powerful, the expense of the powerless, and everything else will just work out. It works domestically. I will give tax cuts and regulatory breaks to people at the upper end of the income ladder, and if it is in fact the ladder, and that will trickle down somehow and everybody will be richer. It works internationally. I go out and kill all the brown people I want, and that will make me safer. And I think this is, and so any time we're getting together like this, I think we have to confront that argument. The first thing we have to do is cry bullshit. Yeah. 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 The sum of the self-interest does not necessarily yield the public interest. And in fact, the flip side can be true. I am more likely to be able to find a job or hire somebody qualified if everybody has access to education. Yeah. Woo! I am more likely to be healthy and less likely to catch a communicable disease if everyone has access to health. <laughs> if we are all, if we all take care of our water and our air, I get to breathe it and drink it. Woo! It works domestically, it also works internationally. I am safer if fewer people want to kill me. Yeah. <laughs> As a bus supporter made plain for two decades at least, we have been dealing with the politics of me, and we have to build a movement around the politics
politics of we. How can we build the politics of the public good? This to me is the critical question of the 21st century. The huge bulk, there's a challenge in all of this, the huge bulk of political muscle that is applied, the vast bulk of people who come, let's say, in my first term of legislature to lobby me, are there to advocate for particular interests, generally particular financial self-interests. And that is not evil. Okay, in our small-d democracy, that is probably is necessary and certainly inevitable. But it is also woefully incomplete. Because a huge portion of our common problems are nobody's job in the market. What's that mean? No. It's all good. Give me five minutes. The, whose job is it to figure out an education system for this century when we still get summers off for the harvest? There is no obvious market profit in that. Where is the obvious market profit in fundamentally redesigning how we spend public dollars on health care? Whose job is that? Whose job is it to reform energy policy? Exxon Mobil's? Maybe. <laughs> so the biggest share of our most exciting and daunting common challenges are nobody's job. And that's why they have to be all of our jobs. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you are so important. As my introducer paraphrased, you are the coalition of the benevolently irrational. <laughs> the good people doing good things for no good reason. And but for you, democracy is not possible. And you are priceless. Definition of priceless, worth a lot, not for sale. Yeah. <laughs> I was asked to say a little bit about the bus by way of introduction and as an example, and it will be very quick, that these ideas of engaging new people in the process Building some degree of strategic political muscle for the common good is what motivated the dawn of the bus. And we were told when we started uh, by a high-ranking political operative that volunteerism was dead. That's a quote. We didn't think it was dead. We maybe needed an ambulance, maybe a bus. And we, and we set out to buy a bus and try to knock on doors in key legislative districts and demonstrate that grassroots energy could change the political landscape in our state. And, the, and, and they were right. Our original plan was going about 10 bus trips, knocking about 25,000 doors. They were right. We didn't do that. We went on about 14 bus trips, knocked on about 70,000 doors, all volunteer. And it was the biggest volunteer canvas effort in that level of politics in the history of our state. Now we've done about a quarter million doors. I say we, I mean a set of volunteers, registered about 50,000 voters. A wonderful set, including Molly Ruskin, who is here. Wonderful set of young leaders. Participated in the project. She's a political fellow. Neat program for, you know, up and coming hot shots. And when we began, a couple things were true. One, we had double-barreled, uh, not only Republican legislature, not the Republicans of Tom McCall, but the Republicans of New Gingrich, double-barreled Republican chambers in our legislature after getting engaged in 24 uh, campaigns, and excuse me, 26 campaigns, and winning 21 of them, okay, helping to win 21 of them, we now have double-barreled flip in those, in those legislative chambers. In 2000, that's good, in 2000, not, it ain't all done, but it's good. The, uh, uh, the, uh, in 2004, this state had the biggest gap in voter turnout between young